<laughs> so welcome again, everyone. We're happy to start the, the session of uh, live talks on gender and climate resilience. Happy to see many of you connected from different parts of the world and from different type of stakeholders. Um, for those who may not know, FarmD, the Forum for Agriculture Risk Management and Development, has been launched in 2009 by the World Bank. And since then, has been bringing together expert and practitioner and bringing forward the talk and the dialogue on agricultural risk um, management in developing countries. Currently, FarmD is managed by PARM, the Platform for Agricultural Risk Management, um, a multi-stakeholder platform supported by the European Com Commission, French Development Agency, Italian government, and IFAD itself. Um, we like to welcome you again, and uh, this is our live talks. We like to keep our webinar interactive and ex continue the exchange on, uh, on and talk on risk management and a specific topic. We'll, we really like to partner with uh, the Digital Resilience Group of Partnership on gender and climate risk finance and insurance. Um, I think it's time, time to start the real talk. Um, so for the occasion, I'd like to give the floor to Tuga Alaskari, the advisor of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, and for the welcoming remarks. Thank you very much. I would actually like to, um, I've seen that with Biko Chinoko, the co-chair of the Gender Working Group of the Insure Resilience um, Global Partnership is with us. So he is um, far better suited so, to give the opening remarks. So Bitten Biko, over to you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, I'm glad to be here, and I do hope that you can all hear my voice. Um, maybe let me just get an affirmation that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. With you. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, let me welcome you to this webinar, and uh, I think it is one of the uh, most uh, important times for us to uh, advance or work of the gender working group. Uh, and I know we are living in very hard times, uh, but even these hard times of COVID, uh, what we've also realized and seen, uh, especially in the most developing countries, is that women are the most affected, uh, be it through the uh, different measures that governments are taking, uh, or be it because of COVID itself, uh, women are the most affected uh, and therefore just giving us more and more reasons why we need to invest uh, in gender responsive uh, development planning and investment. Uh, and this is why I really want to uh, thank the Secretariat, I want to thank uh, FAMD uh, and everyone else for uh, coming to this meeting and really uh, just advance the gender dimension of, of disaster risk management uh, but also more important in the broader development framework. Um, once again, what I would want to mention is just to uh, motivate more uh, on why uh, we find gender responsive development planning and investment very important is because uh, from where I'm coming from in care, we've really seen that uh, one, disasters don't affect everyone the same. Uh, I think we'll find that the disasters really have uh, a gender face. And like, I'm say, like I've said, we've seen that women, girls and children are the most affected. Uh, we've also seen that indeed uh, where you uh, put gender at the center of your, of your development planning, there is actually multiple uh, benefits uh, that come uh, because of that. Uh, we've seen that, for example, in our work around village savings and loans, when we're looking at how women are able to use uh, the benefits from village and savings and loans, uh, they're actually quite different from uh, how men use the same. Uh, we've seen, for example, that women tend to uh, uh, invest their, their, their uh, savings into uh, the climate resilient uh, uh, activities, so they'll buy seed, they'll buy uh, fertilizer, they'll buy um, manure, they'll buy so many other things that are generally uh, long term than, for example, why men would, would invest the same. Uh, we've also seen how uh, 
the investing in women also tends to strengthen the social networks of of uh, of uh, the community, uh, which has actually been a very good platform for sustainable uh, development. Uh, where, for example, other groups would come and and start launching their work because women are already organized and women are more organized. So we we see that I think um, the the long and short of it is that I think it makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, to start looking at our investment from a gender perspective and making sure that our interventions do really uh, respond to uh, the gender dimensions in that particular setting uh, and and um, uh, help us to achieve uh, the development, uh, the sustainable development goals uh, that we might be working on in that particular area. And this is why I do think that uh, what we've seen in care, but also it has been confirmed, uh, with so many other studies out there, and I think our own studies uh, within the IGP on gender has also confirmed the same, that if we focus on gender, uh, we find that our programming and our development will be very impactful. Because I think in the, in the first place, you'll be able to, uh, to categorize, uh, to align, uh, and also to isolate what activities need to be uh, implemented and, and targeted to which group of people. Uh, so that in itself has actually increased the uh, levels of impact on development. And I think that is one of the things I would uh, suggest that uh, if you really want impact, then um, uh, gender-sensitive programming is one approach that you might want to uh, uh, adopt but the other thing that we've also noted is that um, gender-sensitive programming increases our relevance in the communities, but also in the development planning and implementation, uh, because you're very much aware of the issues that come, and therefore you, it makes your, 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 your development work very relevant. Uh, but on top of that, we have also seen that where you don't consider issues of gender in your programming, uh, there's actually very low likelihood that you're going to achieve a value for money. And I, I really want to encourage us that I think if we really want to see value for money, one of the things that we might want to do is uh, make sure that we uh, implement or design our programs with gender at the center. But lastly, which is also one of the things that I find most uh, motivating and inspiring to me, is how making gender the center of a programming, be it within the disaster risk financing or any other development initiative that we want to take, is that it is actually a justice approach. Uh, if we're looking at uh, disasters, we're looking at poverty, we're looking at all the ills in the world affecting women or a different group of people more than the others, then that is actually justice, uh, a, a, a justice issue. And I think it is very important for us to ensure that in all programming, we are actually advancing justice, dignity, and respect. And I think for me, those three or four reasons are the ones that I've seen uh, to be so inspiring for me. And I'd want to really, with those, um, um, uh, those four values or those four reasons, also encourage us in this working group uh, to advance the work of gender because it will make us more impactful, it will make us more relevant, uh, it will give us the value for money, but it will also be a great work of justice and dignity. So with those uh, few remarks, I want to really say that this is what has motivated us within this gender working group uh, to be able to engage, interrogate on issues of gender and disaster risk reduction financing and really to help explore how we can be more relevant and more uh, impact from the ground. So I'm really glad that we're meeting and the, I hope that our discussion will be very, um, uh, will be very, <coughs> will, will be very critical in advancing the work that we're doing. Uh, but more importantly, like, uh, we would love that whatever we pick from this discussion goes back to effect to, 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 uh, to affect what we're going to do on the ground. It's no, Reason for us to just discuss, but I hope this discussion is actually going into uh, uh, implementation of the various work that we're doing. So thank you very much. I wish you all the best, and the, I'll be here and also be in the working groups, and I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Vitam Biko. Um, my name is Catherine and I'm one of the co-facilitators today. Uh, to recap, the objectives of today's webinar are to provide key insights on the rationale and models of gender responsive approaches as presented in the recent Ensure Resilience Global Partnership Study, integrating gender into different models of climate risk insurance. Now you can find that on the web page if, uh, if you haven't seen it already. And then secondly, to present and share concrete examples of existing gender responsive climate and disaster risk financing and insurance, that's CDRFI, approaches and good practices. So we're joined today um, by my co-facilitator and co-author of the study, Martina, who um, uh, we will turn to um, shortly. Um, just a note, though, first of all, on terminology, we'll be abbreviating um, the term climate and disaster risk finance and insurance to CDRFI. And then secondly, what do we mean by gender responsive um, when we're talking about CDRFI approaches? What we mean by that are approaches that not only acknowledge gender differential risks, and vulnerabilities between women and men to climate change and, and the associated impacts, but also uh, approaches that seek to overcome historic uh, gender biases. So just wanted to, to mention that first. So in terms of today's agenda, we're going to start in a moment with a very quick poll, followed by a presentation from Martina and myself. Um, thereafter, um, that will uh, that will focus on the theory. Um, then we'll turn to you all for these two breakout sessions, which will be looking at uh, the gender responsiveness in, in different um, CDRFI um, models and the macro models and also one group on meso and micro models. And that's where you'll have a chance for a bit of discussion. A lot of that will be um, via the chat function because of the, uh, the time constraints and the number of you on the call. We're delighted also to join to the call today, Christiana George from African Risk Capacity, ARC, and Emily Coleman from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and they will be co-moderating and supporting with the two breakout sessions. So um, after that, we'll then be returning to um, the main plenary, and that will be where we'll be able to hear back from the other breakout groups, um, because uh, there won't be a time for us all to be participating in both discussions. And, uh, and your uh, input um, for these sessions and also shortly in a moment will be um, fed into a report which is going to guide Ensure Resilience Global Partnership and other stakeholders in the advancement of the gender responsive CDRFI agenda. And so we really encourage you to, to be open and sharing to, today. So um, we want to start with a poll, um, as I mentioned. Um, so before we start, this, uh, these polling questions are intended to break the ice a little bit, but also to get a sense of the experience that you will have on the call in terms of gender responsive approaches. Um, what you'll see is under the panellists and, and participants box on the right hand side of your screen, um, you should see a box which will shortly pop up, um, which will have the polling questions on them. The first question is, have you implemented gender responsive approaches to climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions or supported others to do so? And the answer there is yes or no or not applicable. And then secondly, do you have an institutional gender policy? Yes, no or not applicable. So if you uh, could quickly um, answer those questions, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, I hope uh, you found the box and uh, have been able to uh, uh, put in your responses to, to these two questions. It's really a little uh, dipstick um, to be able to understand what experience we have on the call. I'm sure it'd be very vast, um, very different perspectives of those of you who are joining. Okay, we've got a couple of seconds left quickly. Uh, thank you. OK, the poll has now ended. So I think now um, we'll see the results and get a little bit of an insight on what those results are, are telling us. So I am not seeing the poll results yet. Um, can our technical support help with um, bring those on the screen, please? Ah, there we go. Super. So in terms of the first question, have you implemented gender responsive approaches? We have 39% uh, who have, 
a quarter of which have uh, have not, and uh, and for the rest, uh, it's not uh, applicable. Um, so we have some some experience there, but clearly there's a, a, a gap. Um, you know, many of you have still got the opportunity um, to be trying and testing some of the approaches we're hearing about today. In terms of the second question, do you have an institutional gender policy? And of that, just over half do, which is fantastic news. Um, uh, but uh, but ten percent of of you um, have got a clear no, so there's a, still a gap there um, to, uh, to to develop one. And uh, for the remainder, it looks like an institutional gender policy may not be applicable, um, or it depends on the different types of organisations you you come from. So um, thank you very much for sharing that information. Um, we'll dive deeper into to some of these questions in the breakout session shortly. Um, but without further ado, what I'd really like us to, to do now is turn to um, uh, my colleague Martina uh, Viedmaya Pfister, who will be um, presenting uh, the uh, presentation on gender responsive approaches to climate risk insurance in theory. Uh, and this is the study that we did in, in 2019. And I'll also be joining her with this uh, presentation in a moment. So over to you, Martina. Thank you. Unmuting myself, starting the video. Should be coming. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, it seems so. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. So a consideration of the gender dimensions of climate risk insurance is essential to its resilience goal to provide climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solution to 500 million poor and vulnerable people in developing countries by 2025. So last year, the partnership made a commitment to intentionally focus on gender and form a gender working group to support this work into Resilience published a study on gender responsive CRI in late 2019. So the, while the gender focus of the partnership is about CDFRI, climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, the study focuses on climate risk insurance and we use this term in our presentation. The main research question of the study was to explore the case and the main entry points for integrating gender and a focus on women into different CRI schemes and provider types at the macro, meso and micro levels. So it's important to note that gender inclusiveness is not about an exclusive focus on women and the exclusion of men. Talking, taking a focus on gender means taking a specific emphasis on them while recognizing that women and men are not homogeneous groups. So it's important to understand how the differences impact the way insurance is designed and delivered to women. And it's also necessary to understand how women use it. This has implications for developing insurance approaches that work for women. Next slide, please. There is a clear policy imperative to integrate gender responsive approaches into CRI solutions because climate change impacts women and men differently. As you can see in the circles, gender responsive CRI lies at the convergence of multiple international policy priorities and global commitments, namely climate change policy, disaster risk reduction policy and financial inclusion policy, which are framed by the sustainable development goals. Some global agencies have already taken concrete action. For example, the UN C has a gender action plan, which was updated in December last year. <coughs> However, while some of these global policy agendas have in fact begun to integrate gender considerations, they have not yet considered the intersection with and role of climate risk insurance, for example, in the financial inclusion agenda. Next slide, please. When we look at the demand side, it is key to understand that women and men face differences in their climate change vulnerabilities, risks and impacts. Simply said, climate change and disasters hit women harder. And women have low, lower levels of formal financial inclusion and they are less formally employed. So the risks, needs, constraints and enablers of women are different from men. 
Many differences are based on gender, the social, behavioral, and cultural attributes associated with being female. For example, whether it is seen as appropriate for a girl to learn to swim, a skill that may one day save her life during flooding, or whether you are prioritized to be rescued. Apparently, being a boy also makes it more likely that you will be rescued. Climate change induced disasters hit women disproportionately and differently to men. For example, women and girls are, likely, are more likely to die in the disaster. Female death rates in cyclones speak for itself. Women's economic activities concentrated in sectors such as agriculture, which are hardest hit, and they have lower adaptive, adaptive capacity to cope with the impacts of disasters, in part due to their unpaid caring role, the gender wage gap, and lower levels of asset ownership. Women also have lower levels of formal financial access. There is still a 9% gender gap in financial access in developing countries. So if we are to boost access to CRI, we have to place this in a wider context where women face financial inclusion constraints, including a lack of collateral to access credit due to rules related to land ownership and inheritance. And women can be less able to provide their identity document to meet KYC requirements. All these issues have implications for the design and delivery of climate risk insurance. The solutions need to acknowledge that risks can vary based on an individual's gender and therefore solutions should consider gender differences. For example, products that reach women need to consider other distribution channels. As said, many women are employed in agriculture, but fewer women own land. So a government agriculture insurance scheme that is based on land ownership may exclude them. An enabler of CRI could be that they form their own mutual or cooperative. And as said, a focus on gender is not about an exclusive focus on women, but it can lead to deliberate strategies that focus on women. These strategies require acknowledging that women and men are not homogeneous groups, and still many other factors intersect with gender, such as ethnicity or geography, that influence the risks people face and the opportunities people have to access and use insurance. Now, coming to the supply side. Next slide, please. There are different models of climate risk insurance. Macro-level schemes are where gov a governmental entity is the policyholder and receives the payout. The insurance is structured as a sovereign risk pool or as a national scheme. Meso-level insurance is a form of indirect insurance that facilitates the business continuity of its institutional policyholders, for example, a microfinance institution or an agribusiness. And micro-level insurance is where people or MSMI, MSMEs are directly covered either in an individual or in a group policy. Notably, both meso- and micro-level insurance are generally offered by the private sector or a commercial government insurance company. Next slide, please. Women and men play different roles within the value chains of these three models, and they can be differently impacted by these diverse models. In all steps, from scheme financing, design, product development, distribution and servicing, and if gender-blind, a business model can reinforce existing power differential between men and women. This graphic indicates the gender context, the roles and gender impacts women face in macro-level models. The diagram varies for all CRI models, and we have the diagram also for the other models in the study. But in all models, women assume diverse functions as investors, leaders or employees, as decision makers in authorities and ministries, as service providers and as clients and beneficiaries. For example, involving women leaders in boards or disaster management committees may increase the likelihood that gender responsive approaches will in fact be integrated. Next slide, please. In the study, we present examples of gender approaches that have already been implemented in different CRI models. We also identified gaps related to potential gender entry points. At the macro level, we found that one regional risk pool has a gender policy. 
the African Risk Capacity, which is a risk pool for 33 sub-Saharan countries. They recently adopted a gender strategy and action plan based on a year-long process that involved consultations in nine countries. Notably, Canada's institutional gender strategy and its investment in ARC contributed to this process. This process and outcome could be a blueprint for other regional risk pools to develop such policies and for donors to these schemes to demand they do so. Within ARC, one country, Mozambique, has already adopted a gender-responsive approach to disaster reduction planning. There is a great opportunity for contingency plans to be gender responsive in the development process, consultation and content, and to draw on sex disaggregated data to inform payout priorities. But currently there are gender data gaps on how the payouts have been used, both who have received them and the impacts the payout have had. Another example is the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative, another uh, sovereign risk pool which requires sex disaggregated data from member governments on the use of national payouts. And the third one is the Caribbean Climate Risk Insurance Facility PRIF, SPC, which also requires member governments to collect gender impact data after payouts. And to mention national scheme, gender disaggregated data collection on payouts is something that the Kenya Hunger Safety Net program is requiring on its cash benefit payments for payouts after drought. Next slide, please. Overall, the study identified various entry points how both regional risk pools and national CRI schemes can integrate gender responsive approaches by involving the different stakeholders as shown in the previous slides. So at the macro level, the following engagements were identified. The creation and implementation of a gender policy for regional risk pools. The integration of gender responsive disaster risk management, and sex dis the disaggregated data collection into the disaster risk reduction plan to inform payout priorities. Gender policies and criteria in investment decision making and financing agreements requiring the collection of sex disaggregated data and the documentation of the use and gender impacts of payouts in the monitoring schemes. So with that, I will now hand over to Catherine to continue the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Um, so turning now um, to uh, meso level examples, there are only a few existing approaches here. Um, one example is uh, the African and Asian Resilience in Disaster Insurance Scheme, ARDIS, and this provides uh, CRI to MFIs that are Vision Fund affiliates. Uh, these MFIs mainly serve women clients in five different countries, and they work with the so-called sort of innovative uh, recovery lending uh, as a framework. And, and in doing so, ARDIS aims to provide both finance and insurance for MFIs to enable post-disaster recovery lending to smallholder farmers below the poverty line. And so its approach has been to target institutional um, MF, so institutional policyholders, MFIs, and these MFIs are aggregating significant numbers, mainly female clients. So they benefit as the indirect beneficiaries of, of this insurance. On the other example, we have the Be Ready program in the Philippines, and this intends to pilot uh, an insurance product for MFIs that provides preemptive insurance payouts. And that's before a disaster occurs, and it's based on triggers such as weather data. And it's taken gender considerations and in informing its digital payouts to women. Um, so on a meso level, insurance uh, generally, there's a need for more pilots um, which target institutional policyholders that aggregate female clients, members or employees. If we turn now to um, the micro level, thank you. At the micro level, there are much greater numbers of gender approaches and some of them are in part influenced by institutional gender policies of donors, such as Canada, for instance. Um, for example, Acre Africa in East Africa has taken an approach to ensure that it has gender diverse workforce and village champions. It collects sex disaggregated data and has conducted market research with women only focus groups and is exploring bundled products um, that are of most value to women. So 
so what, what, what do they really want? What are their risks and needs that need to be covered? Um, while the study didn't identify any micro level CRI schemes that exclusively target women, there are examples of schemes that tailor their value pro proposition primarily to women. Um, Micro, for instance, has a target of 55% of women clients within its portfolio. Um, and there are also examples of index insurance schemes that serve both men and women, but target value chains that mainly employ women, um, such as uh, the global index insurance facilities work with Mayfair Insurance in Zambia. So some of uh, the micro level CRI schemes have taken a gender responsive approach in their distribution as well. And that's through choosing distribution partners that aggregate and reach women. Um, Micro um, has, uh, for instance, partnered with an MFI in Guatemala to extend its reach to, to women. And it's opted for this particular partner because it allows movable assets as collateral and its insurance is sold alongside a credit product. So it's recognising um, the constraints that women have in accessing credit um, due to lack of collateral. Um, the R4 programme, for instance, uh, in Senegal has worked with savings and credit cooperative society, SACO. So Again, another example of a group that aggregates women. So if we turn now to the next slide, um, as we have seen with these examples, there are potential entry points for both models of, of CRI, both meso and micro level schemes. And these include at these following levels. So you can see the four bullet points here. One is around the application of gender policies in financing agreements and programming of schemes. So that's um, Based, based on the donors often who are financing these and applying a gender lens to their investments in these schemes. There's also targeting women as clients, including focusing on sectors and value chains with high level of women's participation or as an extension to women's um, financial inclusion initiatives. We've also got um, uh, an approach where um, there is a conducting financial capability training um, and this is where the training is gender responsive in its content and its delivery and promotes gender diverse participation. So recognising what are those financial capability needs that need to be addressed. And there's also the approach that looks at uh, gender diverse leadership and workforce. Next slide, please. OK, so um, other gender um, uh, entry points include looking at gender diverse risks in, in product design, sex disaggregated client data and monitoring and evaluation, something we'll explore a little bit more later, but looking at it in terms of differential impacts of climate risk insurance payouts, both on indirect and direct beneficiaries. Specifically at the micro level, we also see partnerships with distribution channels that aggregate large numbers of women, and at the meso level, selecting institutional policyholders that aggregate women clients. So, um, if we conclude now, um, over to these, gen uh, over all these gender responsive approaches that have been identified a really good start, but what we've seen is they haven't reached their full potential yet. And to leverage this opportunity, it's going to be really important to be aware that these different models do target different segments. So the private, the, the micro schemes are, are going to be slightly um, um, richer women who are able to afford some of these potentially and uh, and, and the macro is more around this uh, safety net, safety net. So um, in terms of general conclusions, there are varied levels of understanding around the gender dimensions of these different schemes. Um, and specifically at the macro level, there's a need for CRI solutions to address the impacts of disasters on women, including on their unpaid care burden. And I think this is really critical when we think of what's happened now with COVID and some of the lessons learned from, from the, the current pandemic. Um, for women-specific micro-level schemes, um, they provide a huge opportunity um, by specialising on aggregators and women-led um, value chains. But there's a guidance gap on how to implement some of these approaches. And, uh, and some of the approaches haven't necessarily always been strategic. They haven't intentionally um, happened. Um, they, uh, they've uh, not been planned from the outset not to, to devalue them, but it's, it's needed to be built into the strategy of, of the approaches. Um, in terms of um, final um, points, sex disaggregated data, it is required um, sometimes. And if it is collected, there can be issues with it not being analysed to inform product design or understand gender impact. So there's greater role for that. So if we turn to recommendations, what does this actually mean then um, for us as uh, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership and stakeholders in this space? So there are a few um, short, uh, medium and long term recommendations that came out of this. 
in the short term to sex disaggregate the Vision 2025 target of 500 million poor and vulnerable people. Um, and, uh, and, and with that, provide guidance on how to collect this sex disaggregated uh, and gender impact data of the schemes that are being implemented. I think that's really important. In the medium term, there is a huge opportunity. We're seeing gender lens criteria increasingly being taken into account for investment decision making. And, uh, and so there is a greater role for that through the Programme Alliance funding mechanisms. Uh, and to do um, the data collection and also support this uh, gender lens uh, investments, we do also need to have infrastructure adapted to collect sex disaggregated data and support its analysis. We'd also love to see an advisory facility to support schemes which integrate gender and uh, in the long term, ensure that disaster data is sex disaggregated, at least for the V20 countries, if not more, and that this data is used in risk modelling and, uh, and as incorporated into disaster databases and to support uh, the creation of vulnerability maps. So to conclude, there's more to be done, although there's some great examples out there. And we now want to be hearing from you all um, more information about what you're all doing and how you can um, operationalise these if you haven't done so already. So I'm going to pass to Karima, who's going to give us a, a few moments of introduction to the next part of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, it's time for our breakout groups. Uh, just a few administrative uh, tips. So I will, we will send you now to the to different groups. Those that uh, sign up for the meso macro level will basically remain in the plenary. And then those that sign up for the macro level will receive a pop-up message in a few seconds, uh, which is say you've been asked to join a group, just click on yes, and then you'll be sent to the group I work with the African Risk Capacity to guide them in um, integrating gender in the activities of the agency. Just um, briefly, for those of you that might not have heard of um, African Risk Capacity, African Risk Capacity, which we popularly call ACT, is a specialized agency of the African Union and was established to change the face of disaster which was basically looking at the development partners to assist in, in cases of um, crisis. And so the specialized agency was created to change this image by supporting African governments with the capacity to transform the way they plan, prepare, and respond to natural disasters. Acts, um, disaster risk management approaches include a phase of preparation. This is like harnessing the state, a state of art technology through the African risk view for early warning and a contingency planning or preparedness process that builds national capacities to strengthen their disaster risk management systems. There's also a risk pooling system, which is an innovating finance mechanisms that capitalize on the natural disaster of weather systems across Africa allowing countries to manage their risk as a group in a financially efficient manner. We also leverage resources, enabling countries to access rapid, predictable, and early payment when disaster strikes, thus saving scarce financial resources as one US dollar in early response saves four US dollar in late response. Finally, we also leverage on donor support, using donor finances to support public funds and scale up with private finances. As, as already explained to you by Martina, macro level is basically governmental entities that are the policy holders. And if you look at it from a critical point of view, you find out that governmental entities, the member states, take up insurance on behalf of the most vulnerable population. This is therefore a scheme that is gender sensitive and could work for gender transformation if efficiently applied. Government takes up insurance on behalf of the most vulnerable majority of whom are women, disabled, and various stages of um, gender um, categories. 
And so in this breakout section, we are going to look at three parts. We're going to look at one, what has been done or what has, what have we learned in this macro level finance, um, disaster risk financing. Another part is forward looking. What are we going to do? And the last part is a uh, wrap up reflecting on the outcome of this group before we go into the plenary. We're also going to take some polls to get your input. So I asked Martina to help me to introduce the poll and also take some notes. But basically, we're going to look at what is being done at present. Martina has already given you some examples as risk pools, having a gender policy and implementing it, or having a proportionate number of board members and key staff in the organization, or if funders are having gender policy and, re and request the risk pool to design and implement gender responsive approaches. So at this point, it would be great to get an idea of the background of participants on, in this um, breakout group. I would like to invite Martina to take the poll. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm helping here with the poll. So our technical people, can you show how we do the polling? Yes, actually, everybody should have done it once earlier in the plenary. So if you now we will, before we pose the questions, you can again look at what um, the icons you can use at the right side so for raising the hand, for ticking and crossing, and then with the mic megaphone, we can show the results. That's the poll dashboard. So please, the next slide. Our first question in this poll is, have you been involved in the design and implementation of gender responsive approaches in the past, or are you planning to do so? So please give us your vote. Now the poll should appear on the right side. Technology. It's not appearing. Hello. Dini or Karima. You're waiting for the poll to show up at the right side. Uh -huh. Hello. does not appear. Well, in the meantime, um, we would like to encourage everybody to already send us your contributions if, if you have anything to share in the chat, because we will take note of the chats. I will try, if you um, contribute via the chat, I will try to put that in the notes so that we can capture the contributions in written. Uh, I was not able to. Ah, that, I don't see the poll. That's strange. I'm a facilitator, but I didn't see the poll. And I could not vote. So, okay, so 39 participants voted. 12 with yes, 2 with no. And how many hands do we have? The hands are the ones who are saying planning to engage. 2 are planning to engage. So, one third of participants are already engaged in our gender responsive approaches. With that, I hand over to back to Christiana. Thank you, Martina. Um, just to, before we go to the next session, I just want to remind participants that there is a chat box. You can put in whatever information you want for the organizers. Um, all your chats, even if we are not able to answer them, they will feature in the report. And um, so the breakout questions are around about um, 10 issues. Number one, the steps we have taken in practice 
to integrate gender. The gender policy for a regional risk pool. Has anyone experienced developing a gender policy? The planning. Has anyone been involved in integrating gender considerations into a national disaster risk management plan? If so, to what extent does it inform gender responsive payout priorities? How have structured um, structure gender inequalities been addressed? Who could be addressed? Your product, your scheme, design, the stakeholder motivation. How do you think government buy-in can be secured to make macro-level solutions more gender responsive? Which global or national stakeholders need to be involved in the development of such a scheme? The women's participation. Can anyone share information on the level of women's participation within the decision-making mechanisms of macro schemes? Sex disaggregated data, we cannot overflow this issue. Monitoring and evaluation systems. Has any, any of you conducted M and E on the gender um, uh, differential impact of CRI payments? Investment and decision making. Has any one of you applied donor gender policies and criteria to incentivize gender responsive approaches to macro schemes? What are your future plans? Your capacity building and knowledge products. So these are the type of information we want to check, um, put in the chat box. It will be very useful if you can just um, include them while you're listening. And um, they will be taken care of in the notes. In the meantime, we want to go to some concrete examples. Um, between Booker, if you don't mind, I know you have spoken before. You have given us a lot of things. Especially, I noted your four principles. Can you give us something more concrete about how you have been implementing gender in Care International? <coughs> so, the two, two major questions we're looking at. Yeah, so thank you very much. And the, I think for us in Care, when it comes to gender, we know that we've ended up making it a core a principle in our programming. So when we're looking at, for example, one of the things would be assessing the needs before any program is actually uh, designed. Uh, so we already at that level <coughs> using the, um, uh, the approaches that integrate gender even at the uh, assessment stage. So the whole thing around sex disaggregated data, uh, making sure that uh, <coughs> our group as we're doing focus group discussion, we making sure that we uh, separated men and women, uh, and when it be, for example, you bring them back together at some point, but really making sure that in the end you don't just get data which is uh, not disaggregated because that is extremely problematic when it comes to um, uh, designing activities, designing different approaches. So <clears throat> we have at that level uh, of, of assessment. When it gets to the actual proposal development, for example, even in that, we are also very clear uh, in terms of the specific interventions that we want to undertake and how those interventions are going to affect different genders that we are targeting. Uh, so we make sure that even at proposal development stage, uh, unless it is so necessary, unless we don't have data, but to the extent possible, to the extent we can, we make sure that our interventions that we are proposing are really gender sensitive as well. Uh, the other aspect is uh, the same thing goes, for example, even when it comes to implementation. But I also want to explore the last part, which is also very critical, uh, the evaluation and monitoring, especially the monitoring, uh, the evaluation rather, where sometimes it is very difficult, it, it, it is very compelling uh, for some consultants to just uh, not integrate gender in the evaluation process. For us, it is very clear that even in, when it comes to the evaluation of our programs, gender is integrated because it's lessons from those uh, interventions that would all actually help us in the redesigning of the other future programs. So we're making sure that even our uh, evaluation tools, when we're engaging consultants, we are very clear on how we want the gender aspects to come out in those, uh, in those reports. 
Lastly, uh, we also make sure that gender is part and parcel of what we're doing as care, and it is not just concentrated with the people that are working on the ground, uh, those that we are calling the program people, but that everyone else in the organization is a, an ambassador and understands to that extent why gender is important. So uh, when we're doing orientation, one of the things that we're taking our staff through is the importance of gender. You could be in finance, you could be a driver, but in the end, it is our aim that you understand why gender is important to our programming, uh, in particular, but also generally in the whole sustainable development uh, our work that we're doing. So we've made gender to be part and parcel of what we're doing every day. Um, so maybe, I don't know if that was practical enough, but uh, I, I just want to take that stab on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitim Biko. That was indeed practical enough. I mean, you took us through how you integrate gender in the whole of your project cycle up to the point of monitoring and evaluation, um, which is great for people that are new in the system to understand that Integration of gender has to start from the very beginning. It doesn't have to come as an ad hoc. I mean, take it all the way to monitoring and evalu evaluation to enable you start the new phase of planning. Um, we, I want to know if um, Nikki is on the call so that we can have the perspective of a development partner. Nikki James, are you on the call? Hello, yes, I am indeed. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Can you share your experience from the perspective of a donor? Lovely. Yes, of course. So uh, my experience comes largely from being a donor associated with risk capacity. So um, you, you may well, I'm sure, know a lot more about this than, than I do. Um, but when we started off working in, um, on ARC, one of the things that most attracted us to ARC was the fact that contingency plans were developed um, for all the responses. And I think that's one of the most important ways that we can ensure that gender is properly incorporated within risk financing. Um, because right at the start, countries were planning, they were thinking about the kind of activities they would fund uh, through their payouts. And they were thinking about how men, women, girls and boys would have been affected by a, a food insecurity um, uh, situation. And thinking about what they could do, particularly to help them and to reach out. So they thought about uh, where they could use cash, for example, in a social protection program that proactively targeted women. They thought about where they could think maybe use uh, school feeding um, or feeding for mothers and children proactively. And, and by having a contingency plan that built that in, it meant that the, the activities had already been agreed, they'd already been thought through, the target uh, beneficiaries had already been identified. And importantly as well, it gave something that could be followed up and checked. So with the beneficiary checks, we, we could go through and we could actually ask um, people who'd received assistance if it had worked well, if they'd got what they needed, if the quality was good, um, and to get some feedback, which I think is really important as well, because all of these processes are learning processes. Um, I think one of the things that, that came up in, in, in that, that monitoring and evaluation was that there had been instances where uh, gender had been considered, but actually um, there have been things that maybe elements that hadn't been um, un fully understood. Um, so in one particular country, for example, there were polygamous households. So by targeting a household, um, the estimate for the number of people in the household was incorrect. And I think um, elements like that uh, were, came to light really through the monitoring and evaluation and, and then could be adjusted um, for future responses, which worked really well. I think um, we also learned about how you have uh, additional benefits through targeting women in, in particular uh, through the social protection when um, the schemes like, Africa, like hung, the Hunger Safety Net program in Kenya proactively targeted women, um, but also to enable them to enroll in the scheme they actually um, had to, for the first time, get national ID cards and uh, had the benefits of financial inclusion because they received a bank account for the first time. And, and so those, those additional benefits um, were, were part of a process that not just brought emergency assistance in a time of drought, but actually had a much wider benefit 
for, for, for the women in particular in their households. Um, going forward for DFIT, it, it's a huge priority for us in, in our programming. And I think um, we, we specifically now encourage the other risk pools we work with and, and the other disaster risk financing schemes to follow some of the good practice that ARC develops. Um, I think it's interesting that many of the schemes currently don't have contingency plans and they haven't yet organised things like standard operating procedures uh, when there's a payout. And they don't have consistent feedback after. And I think um, as we move forward, that's one of the areas that, that we'd most like to see introduced consistently across um, macro level uh, disaster risk financing. Um, I'm well aware that on the call there are many others who have had first-hand implementing experience. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer questions. And, um, uh, yeah, so if there's anything else I can provide, please let me know. Thank you very much, Nikki. I mean, you said quite a lot of it. And, um, we, as we go back to the plenary, we'll also be able to discuss some of those issues. Now, a lot of chats are coming in, but like I said, we'll, we'll not be able to text the chat right now, so we're going to be able to put them together in the report. But for now, really, um, you said quite a lot of things, but something very important that came out across is the contingency planning. Look at the African risk contingency planning is kind of unique in that um, not just do you have a payout to do whatever you want to do as a government, but um, whatever you're going to do is already written out in the contingency plan. And when there is a payout, you have a final implementation plan that decides, but um, ARC and the member state decides on what exactly is to be done. And so um, through this process, which is consultative, um, gender issues are adequately integrated. Um, because of time, we just go to the next poll. I'll call on Martina again to come in. So the second part of the, of the program for the forward-looking aspects, so she's going to take us through a poll to see the early stages, the ideas, concepts, maturity stage. Then um, she's going to let us know um, at the second level what we, we are to expect, what is happening on the ground. Yes, hello. Um, next slide, please. Can you see the poll? Okay. So we would just quickly like to know where... Um, at which stage your plans are at an early stage, more mature, or whether you have no information. So you can please vote now. Actually, as I can't see the poll, um, ah, yeah, we have already the results. Four, four are at an early stage, three are mature, and three have no information. So um, with that, I think we go back to Christiana. We know more about how people who are planning to do something, where they stand. Please, Christiana. Thank you, Martina. Um, yeah, it's not a catastrophic situation. Plus four are at an early stage. Three have matured. And, um, yeah, the, those, there are some that still do not have information. But we all understand that this is a new area for majority of people, for majority of member states. Speaking from the African perspective, it's actually a new area to mix disaster risk management with gender issues. And so from the African risk capacity, we have put together a strategy to assist our member states to be able to go through the stages so that they get used to it and get to the matured stage where they're able to do things for themselves. They're able to integrate gender by, by themselves. So the, very, the first objective we have 
is to really provide knowledge to member states. So there is a platform at a continental level together with the African Union that is going to look at the knowledge management and development because some of these issues are really very, very um, new to them, new to the member states. Um, just the thought of um, analyzing such disaggregated data is really new to it. It's a challenge to quite a number of people, a number of states. And so um, we're going to be able to, we're going to set up this um, platform that is going to assist member states to th think through this pro um, process with research organizations, which uh, with um, the civil society, as well as the government, to be able to come to the point where they can really understand these issues and be able to integrate gender by themselves. Following that, we are also going to assist the member states to build their institutional capacity, the institutional link and individual capacity. So through the African Risk Capacity, we have the technical working groups in the states. We're going to build their capacities to be able to integrate gender on their own from, with backstopping from the African Risk Capacity. And um, like I said before, um, governmental entities really take charge of the macro level policies that they do it for the vulnerable people. And it is important that they understand this. Although they do, some countries do it unconsciously, it is important that this is understood and it becomes part of their DNA. DNA. So we are going to go through, engage through, um, engage the member states through a sustained advocacy and policy dialogue to ensure that this is a recurrent issue in the annual budget. That's taking insurance on behalf of the vulnerable becomes an, insure, an important aspect of their national budgets. So we're going to leave it at this for now so that we can have some more time to discuss during the um, plenary session. Um, once again, please keep your comments, your chats coming in. And um, we are going to take all that into consideration when we have the final report. At this stage, you really don't need to do anything. Uh, organizers will make sure you go back to where you're supposed to go back. And um, we're going to get to the plenary with um, some Hi, other... Um, um, Christiana, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry to interrupt. We were running a little bit behind. We do have a few more minutes if you want to take some more comments. Um, we've just adjusted the agenda. Um, and we see that there's a big dialogue. So maybe we could take one or two more comments if people want to share their insights. Um, please do put your hand. I see some familiar names like Tara and from the CRIF to get a different perspective to ARC. If anyone wants to come in, maybe we have space for one more comment or two. Great. Yes. Um, Tara, do you want to come in at this stage? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> so I was actually typing my comment because I thought we were running out of time a bit. Um, so I was um, making a, a contrast about CRIF to, relative to the ARC, where the CRIF doesn't actually have these contingency plans which allow for... Um, kind of building in these gender aspects in the design of, of the policies and inception of them. And at the moment, um, CRIF doesn't actually collect um, very detailed gender disaggregated data um, for the sovereign level policies, um, which I, I, I was discussing in the comment. But they recently they launched a product that actually goes down to the individual level um, where the payouts are made to the government and then channeled directly to individual beneficiaries within the fishery sector. And for that product, there has been a specific focus on um, gender and ensuring that women are included in a sector that when you think about fisheries, we think about boat captains and crew members, which would predominantly be men. Um, however, the other aspects of the value chain, such as the vendors, fish vendors and uh, fish processors, where those um, 
sectors are dominated by women, those are they are also included in the potential beneficiaries and governments are encouraged to make sure that women also have access to the to these payouts when when they receive. Great. Thank you for that contribution, Tara. Um, I notice we have one minute more, but we can take one more comment. If you want to say something, can you just raise up your hand? Is there anybody in the audience that wants to say something in the remaining few seconds we have? Otherwise, there are quite a number of comments that have come in here. And um, Martina, do you want us to go to the comments now or you want to take it at a later stage? I think we are right back into... Okay, we're going to resume in the next three minutes. So, yeah, Martina, do you want to take some of the comments? I think Martina is muted. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. I was muted. Yeah. Actually, Christiana, I think we can simply show the results, the notes I took from these contributions in the plenary session because we will, um, yeah. Okay. We great. simply report back, not in the breakout group, so we can now go back to the breakout group. I will upload the notes. Great. Um, while we're waiting to go back to the breakout group, let me just read a couple of comments that came in. Um, there's one that said, when analyzing the impact of disasters for government, um, Ghana's Ghana's situation, I don't know what if um, that is a, an abbreviation, is assessed and solutions can be considered accordingly. Example, in the case of Myanmar, Indonesia. The government has the potential of designing most appropriate mechanisms and link, linking them to, um, unfortunately, the person did not complete it. Um, we have another comment from the African Risk Capacity. Through the African Risk Capacity, prior to participating in insurance risk pools, governments are expected to develop operations plans as a prerequisite. So this define how payouts will be utilized with a particular focus on targeting most vulnerable. So these are some experiences people are sharing across from the chat. And um, we'll put them together, like I said, in the reports, according to the different um, categories. Just please keep your comments coming. They are very useful for us. I see an interesting one that says the contingency planning process itself at ARC is facilitated by cross-functional technical working groups. We ensure that these technical working groups have a representation of women. Okay, so just to let you know that the breakout session is going to end in the next um, 20 seconds. And so just keep, on, keep your chat coming and you'll be taken to you'll be taken back to the plenary. Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, the breakout group on micro and meso models of uh, climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, CDRFI. I'm Catherine, as you've just heard, and I'm your co-facilitator of this breakout. And I'm joined by Emily from IFAD here as well. Um, and uh, we won't see Emily on the screen because of a uh, technical issue, but um, she'll be there and will be speaking to us in a moment as well. So this session, we're going to give your feedback and experiences on, on gender approaches to meso and micro CDRFI in practice. Um, to recap, MESO level schemes are the indirect insurance that facilitates business continuity of institutional policyholders, um, such as MFIs or others. 
whereas micro level um, insurances where people or MSMEs are directly covered by, by the insurance. Um, for those of you that are new to the topic. So we're going to use these insights to inform uh, insure resilience work to further develop guidance on this topic. Um, we've got about um, 20 minutes for our discussion. And uh, in the previous session, we've heard that some of you have implemented gender responsive approaches already, and we'd like to hear a bit more about them. Um, our guiding questions um, broadly for, for this are, what approaches have you taken or you're aware of in the design and implementation of micro and meso CDRFI, what are the challenges, lessons and results that uh, um, have, have come from that? For example, did you address, for instance, women's usage and control of insurance payouts in, in the design of your product? Just sort of one example of what could be, be discussed. So we know it's quite a new topic and maybe not everyone has experience yet or are just starting. And um, you also represent very different institutions. So some of you may um, not be playing a direct role in implementing some of these. Um, so we'll also be looking at sort of generally how um, the different models can be gender responsive and bring more value to women and what different stakeholders can do to, to support that. So we're going to, as part of this, ask two sets of polling questions to all of you. Um, after each question, we'll give you uh, some time to, to react and a few of you to share some specific examples. But what we'd also like is um, uh, you know, for you to raise your hand if you'd like to share something. Um, although, as uh, we've flagged, we're not going to be able to get around to everyone. So um, really, what we'd really value is if you have any examples that you want to share um, so that others on the call can hear them, please can you put them into the chat box? We'll take note of them and also maybe follow up with you afterwards. And we'll input those into the, the report from, from this session as well and uh, in future materials on this topic. And during the session, Emily is going to be taking some notes and, uh, and some of the key insights will be shared by Emily afterwards in, in the feedback to the plenary. So um, without further ado, we're going to go to our first set of poll questions um, and uh, over to Emily, who will um, read them out for us. And you shall see them pop up in the polling box like you did at the beginning of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So hi, everyone. My name is Emily, like Catherine uh, said. So we have just a couple of minutes for you to answer these three sets of poll questions, um, and then it will help to inform the discussion. So you can see them uh, popped up, and I'll read them out for you for the benefit uh, of you all as well. Uh, so the first one is, have you designed or worked on implementation of climate risk insurance products and schemes that only focus on women, mainly focus on women, no discernible focus on women or not applicable. And then the second uh, question is, have you taken steps to identify gender differences in risks and or in climate and disaster risk financing and insurance needs to inform gender responsive product design? Yes, no, or not applicable. And now you just have one minute left to answer these three questions. And the third question is, have any of you taken steps to support the distribution and servicing of women clients in your climate risk insurance schemes <clears throat> that you work on or support? And again, that's yes, no, or not applicable. And so we have um, coming up to 30 seconds left for you to submit your um, poll answers. And then we'll just have a quick analysis like Catherine's Catherine said on these three answers, and it helps us to delve a bit more in depth from the previous responses that you gave in the plenary. And then you'll have an opportunity, like Catherine was saying, to um, discuss a bit more about practical approaches. 10 seconds left, and then we can all look at the results together. Okay, so the poll has ended. And we'll just take a second to get the results up on the screen and um, I can read them out to you and we'll see um, if anything has come across as surprising. Um, I'm sure there'll be some interesting results as we have uh, a mixed group of participants from insurance companies and development organizations as well. Okay, so uh, very good. So for the first um, 
question if any of you have designed or worked on implementation of uh, schemes that are gender responsive. Um, most, I think, are not uh, applicable or no um, discernible. Some have mainly a focus, that's a, a limited amount, 100% only a focus on women. Um, and then have you taken steps to identify the differences? Um, again, that's mostly not applicable, but again, we have more there saying, yes, you have taken uh, steps to identify the gender differences um, in risks and insurance. And finally, the last question of any of you um, got experience in taking steps to support the distribution again most is not applicable but uh, we do have um, a fair number of people that have answered yes sir so i don't know what you think uh, quickly catherine but um, for me i would say it's not surprising but um, it's also good to see that there are some um, examples out there as well but there's definitely um, a lot to do, and, and that is something that I would probably expect. So I'd be interested to hear from people both who say, yes, they have done things, and also the types of institutions that haven't done anything yet. Over mm. to you, Catherine. Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. And and yeah, it's, it, it, it's great to get that snapshot. I think the fact that so many of you perhaps are not directly in, involved in implementing these schemes is, is really a, re a reflection of where the market's at as well. Um, and as uh, we found with our research, you know, there really aren't um, schemes out there that only focus on women. There's a huge opportunity there. If we look at microinsurance schemes more generally, there have been some great successes where that approach has been taken. Um, but there's clearly some experience in the room, so that is fantastic to hear. And for those of you um, who have uh, answered yes to some of those questions, if you could maybe share in, your, in the chat box um, some of your experiences so that we can all hear about that. Um, in the meantime, uh, I think we have uh, someone on the call who has experience implementing such approaches. That's Tatiana Gum, uh, Gumchio from the IRI, um, so that's the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University. Now, I understand that you're on the line and that you have taken gender approaches in the design and implementation of, uh, of this. Can you tell me a bit more about your approaches? and? Uh, and how you've identified gender differences in risks and CDRFI needs to inform gender responsive product design. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Catherine. Can can you hear me? Everyone? Super. Thank you, Tatiana. Sure. Um, yes. No. Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, uh, yes, at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, in particular. Um, uh, for some years, we've been involved in using participatory approaches to collect information from farmers on their experiences of uh, bad years, uh, meaning of, um, uh, say, of severe drought or, or um, uh, severe extreme rainfall, and, and, and um, so that information can be used to design weather index insurance that um, gives payouts that are actually calibrated with the farmer's experiences of loss. and. Um, uh, what I've been involved in most recently with other colleagues um, at the IRI is how to, how to develop um, tools or applications that would allow for scaling out of that information collection, but with a gender-sensitive uh, approach to it. Um, and one way we've been um, working on doing this is through the design of, um, uh, of a game interface. Uh, the, the colleague um, that's leading this, I believe, will be on the line also. Um, uh, specializing in practices of gamification, and so um, uh, but through a, through the game, uh, uh, the purpose is to engage um, farmers to um, um, uh, input uh, their information on uh, bad years that they've experienced. Um, something that we're trying to incorporate, though, is um, uh, uh, kind of the recognition that um, perhaps. Uh, different types of women and men might recall um, historical climate events um, differently. Um, but for example, uh, historical climate events might be very intricately um, intertwined with women's experiences of their personal daily lives. I think. So, so we're trying to incorporate um, something that we're referring to as memory triggers into the game application also that would um, uh, differentially um, help um, women versus men farmers to um, 
uh, recall um, most accurately the historical climate events that have happened to them. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, I guess I just uh, also to wrap up um, as well, just mentioning some of the challenges that we're considering. We have um, the prototype application ready, um, but we're also very much aware of um, the challenges in access to uh, mobile phone applications at the moment mm -hmm. from the prototype and the mobile phone application. Um, and also just in other country contexts, and for example, in, in African context, how um, uh, connections uh, to the web um, uh, might not be um, so um, widespread. Uh, so uh, we're trying to think of innovative, innovative ways to be able to apply um, the game application tool in other contexts. Um, at the moment, um, we've used it a couple of times in um, coffee farming regions in Latin America. Okay. So perhaps I'll leave it at that. Um, just that, that. That, that's fascinating. And, and Tatiana, is there information online that we can turn to, to to find out more if anyone's interested or uh, follow up with you on, on that? Uh, uh, it might be best to follow up with me, and um, I could also forward people to um, other colleagues at the IRI also for different information. Thank you. Um, so we've had, um, I, I think, another person uh, t s say that they um, are in the early stages of designing a program related to risk management. So maybe we could turn to, if we got Victoria Salin um, on the line, would uh, Victoria be able to be unmuted and maybe share a few words about what she's up to? Yes, hello. Can everyone hear me? Lovely. Thanks, Victoria. Far away. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm really pleased to learn more about what your institutions are doing. Um, I'm on the board of trustees of an agricultural research agency, IITA, and primarily their work is to um, enhance productivity of the food security crops, but right now, the entire ag research system, the CGIAR system worldwide is going through some changes. And so as part of the commercialization potential, there is discussion of what does it mean to, uh, and they use the term de-risk agriculture. Um, I work at Texas A&M University, I know a bit about North American production, and uh, I don't think agriculture itself can ever be de-risked. But what I'm very interested in is what's the, uh, possibilities and, and potential for coverage that's handling the the season by season risks that farmers face. And as far as I'm uh, been able to find out from the internet searches I've done so far, there's a lot of interest in total catastrophe, widespread disaster, um, and and maybe not so much development of um, standard crop insurance programs. Um, the IITA has done a lot of effort to interest young people in entering agricultural professions, and some of them, of course, will be in production agriculture, maybe leading a value chain, but I think there's also uh, employment potential in the financial services that can support uh, insurance um, and underwriting and maybe even marketing policies to farmers, and those people may well be uh, uh, women uh, starting those businesses or joining other insurance companies. So that's part of what I'm thinking and hoping to learn more about. Uh, Great. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, be, uh, this whole agenda diversity issue is really Im Im important and um, the workforce of, uh, of of micro and mezzo schemes to ensure that you're able to get that reach to women clients and understand uh, the, uh, the the risks and, and needs that they're facing um, and also can support with the distribution either directly or through distribution partners as well. Um, so uh, it's really important in that it seems in in that design phase um, to uh, to conduct that research to to support um, understanding of what these gender differences are as well amongst clients and women can play a key role in the research of that as well. Um, I think at, at this moment what we'll do we'll turn now um, to our second poll. Um, so um, on this um, we are, are looking about bringing gender responsive. Um, micro and meso models of uh, CDRFI um, to bring more value to women and what different stakeholders can do. And it seems we do have a diverse group of stakeholders on the line who are um, yeah, maybe not d directly delivering um, this. So this hopefully these sets of questions will be uh, be important. And 
so the theme of data comes to mind when we talk about this, partly because we need data on clients, on who the clients are and the impact um, that payouts have had in their lives. And so um, that brings us insights into it in terms of what works or what doesn't in terms of gender responsive approaches. And so particularly with data, different stakeholders have uh, diverse roles to play in both incentivizing data collection, for example, the regulator, to collecting it um, and then actually using the, the data. Um, so development agencies, for example, may play a role in, in using the M&E data, for, for instance, to inform future investment decisions. Um, funding decisions. So in that context, let's turn to our next question. Emily, over to you for the next set of poll questions, please. Thank you, Catherine. So we're going to do the same thing. You should have seen a pop-up window with two poll questions this time. Um, and one is to understand if your organization or the organizations that you work with collect sex disaggregated data on the number of clients served, so more on access and outreach. Um, yes, no, or not applicable. And then the second one goes to a point that uh, Catherine was speaking about earlier, that when she was saying it's not only about collection of the data, but using this data to uh, analyze it and then to make some changes. So question number two is, have any of you conducted M&E on the gender differential impact of climate risk insurance payouts on direct or indirect beneficiaries. So if you're working or supporting uh, schemes at micro or meso level, or if you're doing other sorts of support for uh, development of climate risk insurance, are you collecting the sex disaggregated data? Uh, question number one. Or question number two, are you um, analyzing it to look at the impact of the data? So um, we have about 40 seconds left to collect all of your responses. Thank you for your poll questions, um, your poll answers so far. These are also really useful to use in the report that will be worked on by Ensure Resilience afterwards. So it's a really good opportunity to collect this information with all of the different people on the line. You have 15 seconds left. And then I'll turn to the results to Catherine again. And if any of you have inputs that you want to raise, you can raise your hand or you can write in the chat box and we're monitoring them and we can turn to you for other experiences. So the poll has now closed and it will just take a second for the results to come up and we can have a look at what all of you have answered. So just waiting for the poll to come up. There we go. So actually, this is uh, surprising to me. I don't know what you will say, Catherine, but actually most of you are uh, collecting sex segregated data, 52%, 7% no, and 25% not, not applicable. So that surprises me, actually. And then also um, some quite interesting results in terms of money and impact of payouts. 15% yes, 37% no, and 30% not, not applicable. So I guess, Catherine, it goes a little bit towards what you were saying about not um, a lot of people collecting it, but not necessarily analysing it. You could get from this result. What do you think? Absolutely, yes. So this just reinforces the findings of the study. So I'm really heartened to see this. Um, first of all, that so many um, are already collecting some of this data. Um, and, uh, and we've only focused with our second question on one aspect of how the data could be used. Um, but uh, I really hope that those of you who've answered yes uh, to the first question in, uh, about collecting sex disaggregated client data are actually using it for some purposes, maybe not in terms of impact of scheme, but um, for other management decision making. Um, in terms of uh, the, the not applicable, yeah, my, I always wonder whether that um, what we found is in some of our conversations, some people think it's not applicable, but actually it could be, um, but it's a, a question of not necessarily knowing how to use it. Um, many of you on the call, though, um, you know, do represent stakeholder groups where it really probably wouldn't be applicable. But hopefully you would be able to incentivize the partners that you're working with to, to maybe um, use that data, even if it's not applicable for, for you. 
Um, but clearly, there's a huge gap where um, we're, we need to be looking more at, at the impact and how um, using that data to inform an understanding of how women have been positively impacted or maybe any unintended consequences of um, any of the approaches that have been taken, because we want to minimise the uh, negative unintended consequences uh, to do no harm. So um, without further ado, I'd encourage those of you to share a little bit about um, uh, what kind of data you're collecting, how you're doing using that data in the chat box, and we might turn to you in a moment. Um, I understand we've got Oda Henriksen from the World Food Programme, um, and who is working on the R4 Rural Resilience Initiative on the webinar. Um, now, I understand, uh, Oda, you collect sex disaggregated data and have explored gender differential impacts of insurance um, component of your R4 uh, program in your M&E activities. Uh, would you be able to share maybe a little bit of information about that, please? Yes, of course. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Thanks, Ada. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks and good afternoon to all. So I work, as uh, Catherine said, I work for the WFP's Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction Unit, where I coordinate and provide support to country offices uh, implementing and mainstreaming um, the R4 uh, Rural Resilience Initiative. So before uh, talking about data, I just wanted to give some quick background maybe about the, um, about the integrated approach. And just to say that R4 is WFP's flagship uh, approach when it comes to integrated climate risk management and is contributing to improving the situation of women and girls in rural areas by enabling them to improve their family's income and food security through access to a approach that combines index insurance, social protection, disaster risk reduction, and financial services. So R4 aims to promote gender equality and increase women's empowerment by ensuring women's participation at all phases, and including gender considerations into the needs assessment, the design, the implementation, and the m and &E of the program. So in 2019, uh, R4 reached over 93,000 farmers, of which 60% women, uh, in Ethiopia, Senegal, Malawi, Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Burkina Faso. Um, so R4 conducts national assessments, primarily launched on each scheme to identify gender differences in barriers related to each component of the scheme, and in turn, um, to remove those barriers to access uh, each component. Uh, we also conduct community-based participants participatory planning processes at the local level, which also specifically engage women so that they can contribute to, um, to ensure programs are tailored to their needs and their equal representation in decision making and, uh, and the selection of activities. So um, without going too much into that, maybe to come back to the sex uh, disaggregated data. So along the way, uh, R4 really uses a comprehensive, rigorous and systematic m and system that captures the effects uh, of the integrated approach and as well as in line um, with the WFP's gender policy, uh, collect sex disaggregated data um, at household level. So WFP's man uh, beneficiary manage management system, sorry, called SCOPE, um, registers the head of household, all the family members within the household and their gender. And so R4 output reports um, present sex disaggregated data on the number of farmers participating in each activity of the initiative. And in addition, uh, the R4 outcome monitoring system presents the evolution of households over the period, um, sex disaggregated by the gender of the head of the household. And analysis of such data is um, being substantiated with, with qualitative information that is collected in the focus groups, for example, during gender-specific assessments in some countries I mentioned um, earlier. And over the years uh, of implementing the, the integrated approach across countries, we've had, um, we've, we've observed very interesting results, namely that, for example, R4 is having a positive impact uh, on women's decision-making, with women playing a major role in determining how to allocate the payouts received, um, as shown by a survey conducted in Kenya in 2018, which found that the decision on how to use the payout was mostly done by women, 50%, or in a consensual way between men and women. R4 is also supporting women in establishing small-scale savings um, used to build risk reserves. This component also provides uh, an avenue for women to acquire small loans, to engage in income-generating activities such as rice farming, vegetable cultivation, and small trade. And for example, in Malawi, a survey conducted uh, again in 2018 found that between 2015 to 2015, female-headed households had more than doubled their amount saved uh, compared to 2015. Finally, um, this information confirms trends uh, identified in past surveys. Uh, in Ethiopia, 
female-headed households achieved some of the largest gains in productivity. In short, uh, female-headed households increased their agricultural investments and their spending on hired labor uh, and, and oxen more than other insured farmers and more than the uninsured. Um, in addition to increasing the amount of, of land or, under cultivation, um, and, in, and finally in Senegal, the integrated approach is having a positive impact on women's decision-making and financial autonomy, um, as well as on community solidarity. So I'm wrapping up here. I hope I was clear. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, that's fantastic. And then actually, we really do hear um, quite often cited some of the impact uh, data um, that you've generated um, through, uh, through the R4 um, uh, M&E activities. And uh, I know it's often cited, so it's fantastic that you, you've been doing that. Thank you, and th th thanks for sharing. Um, if we um, now turn, I understand we've got Selene, is that right, from the GIF, um, who may, um, may have something to share as well. Um, so perhaps um, if Karima could just unmute uh, Selene, Conrad, and Selene, maybe you could tell us a bit about the work at the Global Index Insurance Facility Programme and the work that you're doing on uh, with Hi, Day Together. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Thanks, Selene. Okay, thank ahead. you so much. And thank you for organizing this webinar. This is very helpful, and uh, we are taking notes as we go. And uh, what I would like to include here um, is that as the Global Index Insurance Facility GIF program, we will be conducting a survey um, in three countries that we have been operational, uh, such as Sri Lanka, Nigeria, and Zambia. And the reason why we picked these countries is that the program has been operational for almost 10 years now, and we have some good data points in, this, uh, in these countries. And we are hoping that we would be able to design and develop our next step based on the data that we gather um, through this survey. So what we will be doing, or what at least at this stage, what we are thinking of is that we'll be conducting a survey uh, at the individual level with uh, female farmers, with women farmers, and also at the industry level with uh, practitioners. So basically, um, the survey will be um, will will give us some guidelines or insights about purchasing behaviors, uh, household characteristics, and um, also at the industry level some gaps and obstacles and the products available in these markets. So we are hoping that we'll start. Uh, so we are working on on the questionnaires that we that we could implement and. Um, Hopefully, we'll be able to get some results once, of course, we start developing um, in these three countries so that we could also design our, our pro project um, with, the in, with the insights and input we get from these, uh, from, from the survey. I'll stop here. That's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, and one thing, Selin, um, to, to mention, and I guess it's sort of a value to everyone on the call, is the importance of also uh, not only sex disaggregating the data, but disaggregating it around other intersectional characteristics as well, whether that's age or stakeholder group, for instance. And so um, there is, uh, is relevance there when you're looking at, at, at data. Um, just uh, before we close, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I think a main um, from Insured is on the line. Um, can we turn to Elaine, please, uh, to share some of your insights as well, please, on data? Thank you. Do we have Elaine? Am I? Um, you've got your hand up. Um, yes. Yeah, there we go. Super. Yes. It's working for you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will be very brief, actually. I just wanted to say a few words about uh, Insured, which is a technical assistance program. Uh, financed by CIDA and implemented by IFAD through the platform for Agricultural Risk Management. And to mention that in our, one of our components, which is uh, implementation of climate insurance, uh, we, int we intend and we aim to track um, the, the number of uh, households that report using rural finance services. And this is also disaggregated by sex. Um, and Basically, our implementation uh, program is uh, uh, mainly in Africa, but also uh, in Asia. Uh, currently, we have uh, two, um, two, Im two uh, implementation uh, activities ongoing in uh, Zambia and uh, Uganda, and we plan also to do the same uh, in the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and, 
uh, in Asia. Uh, I wanted also to stress that in one of our components, which is uh, capacity development and uh, knowledge management, uh, we, uh, we track also the number of de decision makers uh, and implementers that uh, report having a better understanding of climate insurance. Uh, and this is also done by disaggregated, uh, it's also disaggregated by sex. And um, the aim of all of it is because IFAD and PAM uh, commitment is to serve uh, both rural men and women for agricultural development and agricultural risk management. Uh, and from the insurance side, uh, it helps to scale up the market by reaching out to more people. And uh, it also helps for production and for protection. Um, and also uh, from the donor perspective, uh, this is um, uh, gender is a, is a very important topic and the motivation from our side to collect uh, the information. Uh, so that's, that's all. I just wanted to, to stress this from, uh, from IFAD and insured side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aman, for, for sharing that. Um, I think we're reaching the end of our session now and we're going to be returning to the main group. I'd just really like to thank you all for contributing. And if there's anything else you want to share via chat, there's still time to do so. Continue sharing um, and we'd lo love to hear your examples. Um, th thank you very much to Tatiana, Victoria, Oda, Emily, Selen and Emain for the examples that you have shared. So. I believe that we're now back in our break from our breakout group. So we've got everyone together. Have we got Christiana and Martina there from the macro breakout group? Okay, it looks like we're waiting. Yes. Um, um, ah, we are fantastic. Back. <laughs> You're back. Super, super. Well, I think we're going to now start with the feedback from the macro level group first. And I will hand over to Christiana and uh, and Martina for that. So thank you very much. So I'm trying to upload the document. Can oh, it's opening. Wow. You should be able to see it in the screen, Martina. Yes. And Great. I'm here, so I'm <laughs> amazed it's working. Yes, actually, thank you very much. Um, we had a very lively discussion in the group, actually, presentations and contributions. Oops, now I see the micro one. Can we go back or um, am I the one? Yeah, I'm the one who have a, can manage. The, can everybody see now the breakout group macro level and our summary of contributions? So, CARE, for example, they were mentioning that they are always assessing the needs of women. They require uh, data to be collected, to be sex, sex disaggregated, and they integrate um, gender as a, as a main topic for every staff and in the organization itself, uh, in the headquarter and for program people. ARC also requested to develop operation plans and define how payouts are used for the most vulnerable women and children to make sure they benefit. In Myanmar, the gender situation is assessed in disaster risk planning, which can help to define how payouts are made. Um, we had a contribution of um, DFID as a donor of ARC, and they also look at the contingency plan to do beneficiary checks and get data on the impact and get feedback on payouts. They are struggling with the M&E system where gender has been considered and they are on a learning curve, but as not elements were in the past fully understood, like the number of people in a household or in the case of Kenya, where they um, using a bank account have um, had a much wider benefit for women in the household as they uh, pay out would go to the women. So gender generally is very important in their programming and um, um, generally in, in uh, African risk capacity, many, many schemes are not yet considering gender in disaster risk planning. Um, the contingency planning of African risk capacity um, is unique as they use a consultative product process that adequately integrates gender. And another contribution was on the, that national gender plans in disaster risk financing and disaster risk reduction, they can be used as a potential entry point. 
There was a contribution, I don't know from which country, that contingency planning process is facilitated by a technical working group and they make sure that the group in the group uh, there are female representatives. Another um, question was submitted whether gender, the gender topic can be integrated at an even higher level, at macro level, uh, to require fiscal reporting that can in the end trigger the integration of gender criteria um, and, and which allow, would then allow to report. And then we had a contribution of the Caribbean CRIF. They do not yet collect or require member governments to um, submit very detailed gender data. So there is room to improve that. And in another recently developed product, they, um, where the payout goes directly to the beneficiaries. So this product has a gender focus where, for example, fish vendors um, are selected se sectors which are dominated by women. I'm sure these were not all of the contributions. I, I'm, I'm sure there are many, many more in the chat. And we will add those um, to to the report which will be written, but we can also take um, a few minutes now, I think, back to the organizers to, um, I would like to invite people from the breakout group or the facilitator to add to what I just pre um, uh, presented. Thank you. So, Christiana, anything else to, to add to uh, Martina's feedback from your breakout group? Is that all good? Okay. Well, Thank you so much. I think Martina did a good job. Um, she really gave, gave a good summary of what was discussed in the macro group. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Christiana. So now um, we're going to turn to the, the second group that looked at Meso and Micro and receive some feedback here from Emily, please, from IFA. Thank you, Emily. Over to you. I understand the video isn't working, if that's the case, but we will hear your voice. Yes, thanks, Catherine. Um, so we also split our discussion in the micro and meso uh, session into two parts, mainly on finding out what had happened in practice and the different approaches, and then what can different stakeholders do and how, and mainly focusing really on the issue of data. We had a combination of some poll questions and we heard some feedback. Um, so I can summarise both. So I've just changed my slide. Hopefully you can see it. Um, our first poll, we asked three questions um, about the experience with uh, developing and designing climate risk insurance products and schemes. Um, we found out from this poll that the minority of people only focus on women or mainly focus on women in the design and the delivery of the climate risk insurance products and schemes that they work on. Um, also, we found that, that um, some people, more, more than in the first question, have at least taken some steps to identify the differences in the gender risks, um, so more in the design process. And thirdly, um, it was a mixed response with regards to the distribution of servicing women clients. So from this poll, we got the impression that there's still a lot to be done, um, but there are some experiences out there and there are some people starting to focus exclusively on women as well as including women together with men. In the discussion on the approaches in design and implementation, um, we heard from R4, um, Ode of the World Food Programme uh, Initiative, and one of the um, approaches that they take is to combine uh, different products. So it's from savings, combined in savings groups, um, which include a lot of women, as well as the insurance and the credit and other services within these groups. Um, we spoke with Tatiana from IRI about how they identified gender differences in risks and in the needs for climate risk insurance to identify design. Um, and they have a game tool that um, they're also developing to be more gender responsive to collect more gender specific information. For example, um, they're incorporating what are called memory triggers to understand the impact of risk in the past. So they are noting that it could be different between men and women. Um, a yield loss might have affected a woman differently to a man um, in relation to bad climate events and how it impacts their daily lives. 
However, a challenge that they saw is that in this game tool, they had a prototype application ready, but they have to consider the differences in the mobile phone access, um, especially with regards to applications and uh, connections to the internet. So they're trying to understand um, innovative ways to overcome this. And then there was a point raised by Victoria Salin from um, on the board of IITA um, about perhaps the different uh, groups within um, uh, women. Obviously, they're not a homogeneous group like uh, Martina was saying at the beginning. So to consider in particular youth uh, within this and the importance of women in the workforce um, for the delivery of the schemes. Um, on our second slide, uh, our second poll, it was quite interesting to see that um, most people do collect sex disaggregated data um, on the number of the clients um, served. And um, a lot of people, but not all the people that answered yes in the first question, are also analysing the impact of um, the payouts on uh, different beneficiaries. So this highlighted that um, people are um, taking note of um, uh, how these programs are reaching out to women, um, but also that there might need to be more analysis done. And in that vein, uh, we also heard from R4 who are collecting the data and analysing the data including some specific gender studies in the countries that they're working in. And from this, they were able to see that, for example, in Kenya, 50% of women were now making a decision on how to use the payout, and others were making it together with men. And also, they were able to analyse trends, such as female-headed households had the biggest gains in productivity, more than other insured farmers, and uh, more than uninsured people as well. So I think I'll stop there. Um, there's some other points that came from um, GIF, who are using it to um, inform future design, um, but I know we have limited time left. So thank you to everybody for their inputs. Super. Thank you, Emily. And, uh, and don't forget that uh, the insights that we've generated from these breakouts will be available in a report uh, that will be shared afterwards um, based on the, the discussion. At this point, as we draw to a close, I'm going to um, pass back now to Vitan Biko um, to make some final remarks So and to discuss the way forward. So over to you, Vitan Biko. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Andy. I think I'm really I'm very encouraged by the progress that we're making. Uh, by the passion that you have for the work of gender. Uh, and I think hearing the discussions uh, from the beginning, but also from the uh, feedback from the two uh, work, um, uh, breakaway sessions, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, encouraged that we're on, a, on the right path. Um, I think what, what I take from this meeting is that, uh, one, it is important that we have a deliberate policy that is very specific uh, to ensure that we uh, integrate gender into all our disaster, disaster and climate risk response. Uh, we should not just depend on other policies that mention about gender and thinking that that or those policies are going to uh, help us uh, integrate gender. So it is very important that I think we have uh, a deliberate policy in that regard. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the things that we've discussed, and I think I could allude that coming from different directions, is that I think in order for us to do that, especially when it comes to working on the ground, I think data is very important. But at the same time, data is very difficult to obtain to inform our programming, uh, especially when it comes to disaster uh, risk management uh, financing. Uh, and therefore, I think it should be one of the things that we, when we're talking to government, to invest in really uh, coming up with data which is usable, which is current, uh, but which is also in a manner that is consumable by different stakeholders. Uh, and I think that would go a long way in helping us to, 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 to plan uh, our work. I think it was, it was interesting to also hear a lot of um, 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 feedback, especially around the role of contingency planning uh, and how contingency planning really uh, help in terms of of, of uh, integrating gender and those uh, contingency plans. I think 
uh, contingent planning and when it comes to uh, CDRFI, uh, those are the opportunities for us to already think, to, to already to start to think what are the gender dimensions in these things. And most of the times, I think from what we've heard, uh, government are just too quick to agree to some of the gender language in some of these things. Uh, but when it comes to implementation, it is actually very difficult. So it's important for us to follow through. Uh, lastly, I think it is very important, I think, that we ensure that uh, in our programming, we make it a deliberate policy as well, that we're going to uh, integrate or we're going to consider gender, uh, because these things are not just going to happen by accident. I think there has to be very deliberate uh, thinking around it, uh, to wanting and to making sure that we uh, integrate these things. So if it's a programming level, uh, maybe the example that is coming from care could be one of those guiding principles, making sure that integration of gender is actually one of the um, uh, guiding uh, principles when it comes to uh, implementation of our work. Only when it is uh, something that is a must, that is when it cannot be skipped or overlooked when it goes into, uh, into the planning uh, processes. So I think for me, I would say that I've really been very much encouraged uh, by this uh, webinar. Uh, I think our capacities are way higher than we started the webinar. Uh, going forward as, as the uh, working group, we want to continue to host um, such type of webinars uh, because we do believe that there is a lot that we can benefit from exchange of knowledge. Uh, but more importantly as well, we hope that we're also learning one or two things that we can take back into our implementation. Uh, the Secretariat will uh, continue to inform us of the uh, progress that we're going to we'll continue to make. Uh, there's a couple of things that we uh, want to 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 uh, to, to uh, say to, to to the membership, and I think the secretariat will soon be uh, contacting us on the same. Otherwise, I'm really uh, happy to have been uh, in this call, and uh, uh, I've learned quite a lot. And I do hope that all of you uh, will be here again when we call next time for us to continue to exchange. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Tuga. Okay, I think we've got uh, Astrid uh, joining us. So, Astrid, uh, are you connected? Super. Yes, can you hear me? Perfect. Thanks, Astrid. Over to you. Thank you. Just to uh, really uh, wrap up and finalise, so uh, on behalf of all the organisers here, also from IFAD and the Resilience uh, Secretariat, um, and um, all that have been really instrumental to set this webinar up. We thank you very much for joining. We are grateful for all your time and your very valuable contribution. Um, we also uh, want to uh, emphasize this is our very first in a series of webinars and uh, we just lack the foundation. So please um, look ahead. We will have more webinars coming up with a deep dive into key topics. The next one, for example, will be entitled um, Demonstrating Impact, Gender Responsive CDR Defiant Data Challenges, the data uh, is uh, uh, crucial as it will look at success factors and opportunities for designing the right indicators, collecting and analyzing sex disaggregated and gender data to determine the gender impact of schemes of the solutions. We will have, hold this in September um, with FarmD and the Injury Resilience uh, Secretariat. Um, both will uh, send you more information in your course. You can continue the dialogue, uh, by the way, using our platform, our um, interactive online platform, Risk Talk. And when you uh, access um, the website of injuryresilience.org, you'll find uh, um, a link to register and you continue the dialogue and also share your experiences and uh, share your questions and um, topics on the agenda. Um, you also can contact the Secretariat, uh, Indo Resilient Secretariat, to explore potential collaboration to drive this topic further. There will be a report of this meeting in a week's time, and of course, we hope to continue this lively debate. We also want to announce a quick uh, information 
on the UNFCCC momentum, um, the June momentum for climate change, as we'll have a gender and climate webinar global launch event held by the 8th of June. And uh, the UNFCCC is one of our dear part members here in the, in the partnership. You can find more detail on the UNFCCC webpage. I also want um, to um, um, say that you can keep in touch through our co-host of the Farm D platform community of practice on agricultural risk management. And finally, also, we just launched a series of uh, webinars. We hope to continue uh, also with all of you in a lively discussion. Also, uh, it would be very kind of you to give us a quick feedback by filling out the survey at the end of this uh, webinar in the last five minutes. Uh, so please hold on. Uh, once again, I want to thank you very much. We are very much looking forward to seeing you all in, in the next webinars. Thank you all and have a great uh, afternoon, day, wherever you are.